right, we are live now. Welcome. Welcome, world, to Chronicles of Future Earth. <laughs> and Sarah Newton, the creator. Welcome. Hello. In, in the flesh. In the, di the digital flesh. Absolutely. Well, there's an ungodly hour in the morning. I mean, I where you are. Ah, yes. Well. Thank you for uh, for agreeing to make it work early in the morning and and for here it being late late at night so it worked out. I know. I don't think we couldn't we couldn't really get further apart, could we? I think we've got massive time difference between us, <laughs> West Coast and uh, Middle of Europe. It's, it's it's quite an achievement there. Indeed, indeed. Uh, but works out. So um, so I guess we should start with a. Uh, with a pitch, the pitch for for Chronicles, would that that be a good place to start? I think. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, so Chronicles of Future Earth. What is is it? It's a massive cosmic fantasy setting. Um, it's fantasy role playing. Um, feels like fantasy role playing. But it's got underneath it the suggestions that there may be something more going on, perhaps something maybe a bit sciencey going on in the background. Um, it's a very, very far future setting. It's it's our own planet, our own planet Earth, but maybe a hundred thousand years from now. Um, and the the world has gone through so many changes. There's been massive civilization come and go. There's been a, a vast interstellar civilization, um, which has which has colonized thousands of worlds and which has fallen. Um, in a time so distant that it's been completely forgotten. Um, and what we have now um, is a, a set of, of squabbling civilizations um, around a middle sea um, during an ice age. The Earth is in an ice age. Um, the world has been thrown back on, a, on an almost pre-technological era. A ancient world, um, a little bit of a medieval feel, um, lots of ruins everywhere, sometimes ruins made of substances that people don't understand. Um, there are gods, there are monsters, there are non-human species, some of which are very, very strange indeed. Um, and there are relics and artifacts of these ancient civilizations from the far distant past um, everywhere. Function. Um, so it's a little bit like you're, you're adventuring in ancient Byzantium or Egypt or hmm. Sumeria or Rome. Um, it's, a, it's a slow... Slightly Eurocentric feel, um, but at the same time, it's displaced. The the chronicles take place um, in a west, um, the western part of Africa, um, the Iberian Peninsula, is the is the heart of the setting. Um, but it's during an ice age, so the the climate bands have shifted south, and Iberia is um, a little bit a little bit cool temperate. And the north of Africa is very much what we call warm temperate. And it's only when you start getting to the south of this massive civilization called the Venerable Autocracy of Saqqara um, that you, you start getting a little bit cyclical. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the civilization um, is one of the springtide civilizations, which has grown up um, on the, the shores of, of this mid where all the sea levels have fallen because of the ice age and the continental shelves are exposed. Um, and there are cities built there that have been there for literally thousands of years. Years. Um, the Venerable Autocracy itself is 15,000 years old. Um, it was founded after the after a great magical disaster, in fact. Um, not the original, but another one um, that precipitated the Ice Age um, and caused massive migrations uh, and a new civilization springing up around the Middle Sea. Um, the original disaster, which collapsed this ancient civilization that was presumably star-spanning, um, is called the Armageddon of the Gods. It's written about in a great text called the Helimoriad. Um, explains how um, humankind joined with the gods, learned how to worship the gods, and pushed back um, a massive force of evil called the Great Hegemonist, who being pushed back, unleashed upon the world the Reaver Gods, um, these terrible chaos creatures which threatened to destroy um, reality, basically. Yes, the Reaver Gods. And a lot of the history of the Springtide <laughs> civilization since the Reaver Gods, that's right, has been, about, yes. has been about pushing back um, and keeping back the, these, these chaos creatures. So that's a, that's a very quick thumbnail. I could go on and I've been writing this for about 20 years. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff out here and a bunch of books I've been working on. Um, but maybe that's a good, good place to start. 
Yeah, yeah, that's great. Excellent. Tw- 20 years, is that's wild. Um, so I've said a couple times that uh, on the stream, and, and these were just projections of mine, that, that it felt very Michael Moorcock, it felt very Jack Vance, um, but I've been kind of just plugging those names uh, onto something that I was seeing. But what um, what were your literary inspirations, so to speak, or, or game inspirations or art inspirations or whatnot that, that helped create Chronicles? Yeah, it's actually a really, it's, it's, it's a strange answer to that question. It's an art inspiration. Above all, it's an artistic inspiration. Um, the the um, artworks of Bruce Pennington hmm. were my original spur to writing the Chronicles. Um, I grew up with um, with all the new English library um, covers of things like Dune, um, The Pastel City by M. John Hans, Gene Wolfe's um, Book of the New Sun um, mm. series. Um, all, all of those, even the Edgar Rice Burroughs, the, the, the Barsoom series. Yes. Bruce <laughs> Pennington is a gorgeous series of covers which feature things like, you know, pastel pink and green and blue skies with them. Um, with slumberous ruins and great, great confidence, flying saucers and horses, and this sort of science fantasy feel, um, which really just went deep into my DNA from from my very earliest years. So, for a long time, when I was uh, a young gamer, I wanted to to create a setting um, which reflected Bruce Pennington's works and which mm. felt like uh, you were playing in a in a in a, in a Bruce Pennington. Um, illustration. Um, so that's really the the initial spur uh, for, for the Chronicles of Future Earth, and that starts somewhere in the, the 1980s. I sat, hmm. sat down and seriously to write it. I think I did my first map probably in the late 80s, um, but it, was, it wasn't a particularly good map, and my knowledge of, um, of climatology and, and, and uh, geomorphology <laughs> was pretty crude at the time. Um, so I redid that um, quite a lot, but the, the principle was that. Um, the, the, the great cities which are built in a technological era and when the sea level falls rich um, the cities sort of have to migrate with them down to the new coasts you end up with these elongated massive cities in some cases with ancient um, post-technological citadels on the high ground and port cities which have been newly built maybe 30 40 miles away but linked by roads and walls and, and, and what i call precincts which are basically interim villages um, by curtain walls um, so that, that kind of principle was there from the beginning. Um, literary influences, I guess it's the really obvious ones, you know, the ones I've already mentioned. Um, there are so many, um, the, the Jack Vance dying earth wasn't a principal influence. I, I suppose if, you, if you're looking at the people who really inspired me, um, you really are looking at M. John Harrison, um, Gene Wolfe, Edgar Rice Burroughs. Um, and then on the gaming side, um, obviously my, my big gaming love has always been the Rampha and Rune Pass. Mm, mm-hmm. Um, and in a sense, you know, we have a, a techno fantasy refraction of some of my thoughts about um, about Glorantha in the Chronicles. It's not by any means a mythological thing. Um, it's it's very much a, a human based or a transhuman, a post human fantasy, if you like. Um, so so it's not full of the the, the hero, the Campbellian hero that you see in Glorantha. But it's certainly there in the, in the way the game is structured and the sort of experiences you can expect at the table. Um, and on top of that, there's Tecuma. Now, um, there, are, there are so many other um, settings of that ilk. But I don't think it's principally derivative in that sense. I think it sits among them as one, one, one among many. Um, and I think if you want to really trace it to its source, it's, it's the artwork of Bruce Pennington. Excellent. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I can definitely see that. Um, and, and like you're saying, it's uh, every story's already been told, they say, right? But you're just putting putting a, a very unique and interesting spin on, uh, on all these inspirations kind of rolling around in your head and creating something something new out of it. So, yeah, I, I really dig that. Um, uh, one, one, thing, one thing I like doing um, is having, is having a, a, an idea behind a setting, a big idea behind mm-hmm. a setting. Mm-hmm. And I like it also, I like to play with modern day ideas um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a science fiction or, or any kind of role game, in fact. Um, and without being overtly political, um, the, the, the Chronicles uh, of Future Earth is set in a world where seem to be 
um, clear and planned and something belonged to the past, where society has seemed to be stable and relatively comfortable, you know, with its own problems and so on. But suddenly it finds itself at, a, at an impasse. It finds itself threatened by forces that it can't really control. Um, and that it's it finds itself spinning out of control and forced to massively to adapt um, to these to these new threats. Um, and in a way, I'm I'm playing out what I see happening around me today in our world. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's there's a there's a parallel where the, where the you know historians have all, always argued about when centuries really begin, if they do at all. But I think you know I see now we're in a conflict where civilization we had is being 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 swept away by new forces of, of globe forces of a, of, a, of, a, of a nascent global society mm -hmm. um, of technologies like the internet which are revolutionary and the old order is hanging on with its fingernails and trying to stop things changing um, and that kind of um, that kind of approach to me is something that you know is a source of drama um, and I think in, in the chronicles you know it's refracted it's not it's not an allegory it's not a one for one correspondence but but you can play through some of those ideas in the same way that with Mind Jammer, for example, you mm -hmm. can play through the ideas of, uh, of imminent, the imminent singularity of, of, the, of the transhuman issues we're facing uh, nowadays. You can play through those in the game. Chronicles is a, is a, is a similar kind of approach. Yeah, and exciting that you can tell a uh, tell a relevant modern story in in a uh, in some ways a very ancient uh, kind of setting. It's it's fantasy that is remaining still politically relevant, um, and and not just kind of telling the same hero's journey story over and over again. Right, we're talking about modern themes. So um, yeah, that that's that's a... right. I mean, you should be able to you know work through modern questions if you want to. It's not it's not a political theory textbook but it's there if you want to if you want to play those kind of questions through you you, you can do yeah yeah so um it is it's a fake core uh but heavily uh modified many many new mechanics uh that are all at work um i know that uh, that the the common question is always the the dice and uh and the the bonus cap and whatnot um but people can can read all about uh kind of your logic behind that elsewhere i was really hoping that you could talk about some of the magic systems um you talk about uh advancement i'm really intrigued by um, how how characters could uh, advance on different spectrums. I get this impression from the quick start rules. Um, and yeah, I was hoping maybe you could talk about some of that. Yeah, I mean, I think I think advance is such a, a key trope of any fantasy role-playing game, much more so than in science fiction role-playing mm -hmm. games. And, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a great lover of fake core. Um, was, was my go-to system and it remains one of my very dear systems. But Fake Call, for me, had something revolutionary. It changed the way that I viewed games from a game mastering point of view. Um, um, can't, you know, Fake Call itself, everyone tells me, doesn't, doesn't naturally lend itself to an obvious um, character advancement progression. Um, and I, mm -hmm. I would agree with sense that the, the rules themselves don't have a clear linear progression beyond you know, increasing your skills along the pyramid and perhaps bumping up your number of stunts and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, that doesn't easily match one-to-one -one with the linear progression you get with levels, for example. Um, but from from my point of view, that's actually a, a, a good thing. It's a li liberation. Um, I think a lot of role-playing games have, have followed the, the very clear and, and very easily understandable paradigm that, you know, a hero goes from one to two, or 30 or 40 or whatever, um, along the clear single path. Um, and okay, there have been occasional uh, attempts to break that paradigm by saying, okay, you can multi-class and you can, you can progress simultaneously in two classes. But it's still been the same concept that you're basically moving along a single line um, of progression. Um, Fate Core is able to explode that paradigm. Um, and it has something called extras. And extras, um, basically were fake cause articulation of something that we'd all all been doing editions but hadn't really realized it. Um, <laughs> yep. you know in in, in fake in fake third edition you could you could summon a demon and, and you know you'd kind of have that demon around with various tools and stunts of its own and its own stress track and that kind of thing and you could send a demon into combat and that kind of stuff 
um, but it wasn't really integrated in a deep level into the rules. Uh, the extras rules um, are very short in the, in the original Fate Core book, you know, only a couple of pages really, um, but there's a lot of juju in there and it, it decompresses into this, this massive you can start extrapolating from. Um, and we started doing that in Mindjammer, um, and we rapidly found that it came up against certain logical blocks. Uh, um, you know, we, we used extend. I think I used extras too much in in articulating equipment in in Mindjammer, hmm. and because equipment is such a key thing in fantasy role playing games, I've changed how we implement that in in um, the Chronicles. Um, but the extras rules themselves, uh, I've really taken those as the way in which your character not not only um, extends into things like summon demons and having demon swords and having magical items and so on on their character sheet, but also extends in, into the world. Um, so on a character sheet in the Chronicles of Future Earth, for example, you can have statistics which represent a legion that you belong to. And um, you can have them representing or, or the house or the guild that you belong to. Um, and each of those things in, in fate, the fate fractal, the principle that everything is a character, means that, mm -hmm. for example, the legion that you belong to might have a number of, of skills and a number of stamps and a number of aspects. And indeed, if you want to, you can play a game where everyone around the table is playing and you can play the second more abstracted game if you want to. Um, but in the normal game, you would have these legions on your character sheet. And when you use one of, say, your legion skills, example is the resources skill. Normally when you roll your own resources skill it represents how rich you are personally um, and how much how much money you've got hanging around. Um, how buying something. When you roll the Legion's resources skill that's on your character sheet and um, it represents your ability to tap into the Legion's coffers mm. and it, it's based on the Legion headquarters and saying look I, I need I need this sword, I need a new set of armor, I need I need a, a squad of ten troops to accompany me on this mission. Um, how about it? <laughs> and, um, your Legion resources, um, and that determines whether or not you can get these get these uh, get access to these resources. So that's a bit of powerful stuff that you can have. Your character has stopped being this principally organic individual and started having social relations um, and interactions built into the character sheet. Um, and as soon as you do that you can see that with advancement, what you're doing is you're extending your character into these different arenas of action. Um, and very quickly, you lose this idea that advancement should be a linear progression from one to 20 or 30 or 40, um, and instead be an expression of how you see your character's destiny developing. Are you gonna become a warlord? If you are, you want ties into the Legion, you want, you want some troops on your character sheet as extras, which with your advancement points, you're going to build up. You're going to make them more powerful, more numerous, you're going to give them better, better equipment. And your advancement points that you get as you, as, you, as you play allow you to build these extras bigger and bigger. So if you want to become a high priest, it's not simply a question of reaching level 10. You actually have to build the temple on your character sheet. The temple exists out there, and it might have all these marvellous skills, which you couldn't initiate initially as an apprentice of Ford on your character sheet. Um, but as you advance, you can start integrating this temple into your character sheet and it becomes something you can control. Um, so you can see suddenly that first of all, there is no top level. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, can, you can start advancing along the certain path. You can become, you know, it's a bit like, you know, Conan the King in but and now you've suddenly got Conan the Sorcerer and Conan the Pen of the Priest and this kind of thing. You can advance your character into different areas, different arenas of action. Um, and it really liberates the concept. You know, it becomes much more dramatic, much more organic and built into how you view your story. Um, and then it's up to you what you do as a party. You know, your, your characters can each advance in niches. Do you end up with this sort of big council of elders where one person's a high priest, another person's a warlord, another person's a high artificer with command of all kinds of, uh, of art artifacts and technologies, another person's a grand sorcerer capable of summoning great demons, named demons and things like this. Um, or you can all advance together um, and, you know, end up as the key parts of a temple, the key parts of a city or a nation. You know, you can be governors and, and, and administrators and so on. Um, so it really opens up advancement in, into 
or narrative sphere, but also which has really concrete game mechanic uh, consequences. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, in the way that fate can be so wonderful about um, not every character has to be a- excellent at combat. Um, that that some characters can be uh, can be the the money, and some characters can be um, the rapport, and you know, and and all of them can still feel very powerful and interesting in their own way. Then you're kind of opening up this sphere of of saying, well, what if my character is the community? Uh, what if my character is kind of the artificer? Um, and and that's really exciting that it's opening up some some doorways that that uh, don't normally exist in in a traditional fate. Um, but that are part of the narrative of, of fantasy. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so your, your, uh, mention of, uh, still tying to advancement, but in the, uh, companion supplement, uh, that you're, that you're teasing, uh, us with, uh, on the Kickstarter of one of the updates, uh, you're, you're saying here, here are the many supplements that will come, um, what was yes. a, a, <laughs> a mention of a of mythic level play um and and i'm just trying to uh imagine and get my head wrapped around uh the the very top of your vision of of advancement what what does mythic level play look like in, in your in your mind yes well first of all mythic level play isn't part of the core book um, and okay. that's that's most mostly because with the core book i wanted to target very much um, the Chronicles setting, the Springtide civilizations. So basically, um, in the core book, you go to a sort of epic level day, um, because the, the Springtide civilizations are not principally a mythic or a mythopoetic setting. Um, so this isn't Glorantha. You know, this is a different kind of setting entirely. This is, this is based around a logical, almost scientific underpinning. You know, It's fantasy, but it's also got this sort of hawk moonish science mm. fantasy underpinning so epic level play is appropriate um you're going to be at the top levels of play you're going to be hobnobbing with some pretty pretty big powers you know there are there are greater demons out there there are there are some forces from the, the helimoriad when the great hegemonists and the reaver gods almost destroyed the world there are some massively powerful forces out there which you will be coming up against at the higher levels of play so epic level play does not by any means stand below mythic level it sits alongside it um, and the core book deals with that um, with the mythic stuff with with them um, i should probably give a bit of background um, i worked on a game called legends of anglaire back in 2010 2011 with chris birch now of modicius um, and that was a fantasy implementation of a fair eight called star blazer adventures which i love to it was the, one of the first eight games i owned and the first one i wrote for um, and in legends of anglaire um, that was a pure fantasy implementation it was you know swords and sorcery plus high fantasy there was no real whiff of uh, the sort of science fantasy the cosmic fantasy that's chronicles um, but in that we we tried to address both epic fantasy um, epic level play and mythic level play um, and I think we did a pretty good you know made a pretty good first of it there was um it was a situation where you would progress from your normal occupations and um, in having occupations which were which were of a mythic level or an epic level you know um so warlord and high priestess might be might be epic occupations um something like um a cultural hero or, or parable um or, or or divine progeny or demigod might be mythic level occupations um mm. and i've kind of moved ahead the entire occupation concept called builds um which to me make make great sense that they're a, they're a kind of um hybrid of of a pick list of skill stunts aspects and various abilities but also built in with prerequisites um so in some cases you can have a an open build which might be you know the occupation you have um, and that gives you a pick, pick list of things to when you create your character um or you might have a slightly more closed build which would be um your your kindred which is your species or race for example um which would mandate certain abilities which you would have to choose in order to be part of that kindred. Um, and that's that pick list is is what I've called a build in, in the Chronicles of Future Earth. Um, and epic level play goes up to a, a series of builds which really 
um, expand your character into these arenas that I've been talking about. Myth mythic level play um, does a similar kind of thing. And yes, that's that's going to be something that's um, in the in the future genre packs that we've got planned for, for the Chronicles. Um, if you do want to get into the, 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 the state of becoming up again, the gods and demigods, um, if you want to step into the paths of myth, if you want to do the full Candelian path, um, then that will be um, the, 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 the supplement to look at. Um, you'll probably tweak your setting there. If you want to play in, in other either pre-existing or homegrown settings where mythic level play is a thing, um, that'll be the way to do it. You can interact with, in the same way that you know the fake fractal allows different for anything to be a character, um, dimensions can have statistics. Um, and deities and supernatural beings can have statistics in a way that doesn't require them to have millions of hit points. Mm. Um, they can be they can be addressable on a, on a fate level, um, and that just quickly leads me on to one more point, which I think is really important in fate, um, and it's something that I've been exploring myself with Mind Jammer and with Chronicles, is the concept of scale, um, and I love one of the one of the real real winners for me in, in fate as a system is the way that it handles interaction between scales mm -hmm. um, and what's a scale a scale on a very simple level is a size a size difference so you've got a large monster and a medium character how do they interact right. in most games that's that's a, a simple matter of, of degree you know you get a you might get a bonus to to hit that uh, that uh, large um creature and that large creature might have a a penalty to hit you, for example, in combat. Um, that's fairly, um, fairly clearly understandable. It's fairly intuitive. Um, but what, what fate does is it allows you to identify things on a more abstract level with scale. Um, so in Chronicles, for example, you can have social scale. Um, whereas if you go, you know, you might want to try and um, intimidate the king. Um, he's a fairly big target. Everyone knows who the king is. So if you start slagging off the king, you know, you're your target's going to get hit, but he's so far above you in terms of he's going to be able to shrug off that damage, any kind of social effect that you make on him. Um, so that difference in scale is something that can be moved into a social sphere, um, and it can also be moved into a more existential sphere. So you can have you can actually have your mortals, heroes, demigods, and gods all mapped out on, on different scales um, in the same way that you can try and affect you know when when um, when you have a hero like conan who suddenly takes on a small squad of people and knocks them to uh, um, to merry hell or you have um, sauron in the in the lord of the rings movies that that wonderful scene at the beginning where this massive sauron comes down with his with his hat and he's whacking great mate and into the elven and human army knocking people you know hundreds of feet to either side with his with his swipes that's a difference in scale that very easily maps itself out um, in fate and that's something that um, you'll see in epic level play when you interact with organizations with legions with guilds with armies and also in mythic level play when you great beings yeah in the same way that other uh fate systems do a a, a thing where you're you're saying um kaiju and uh and mechas are fighting on this scale but the individual people um fighting on the smaller scale can't quite interact with one another but the mechanics are not um they're not dealing with these astronomical numbers instead you're kind of just shifting from uh well you know this this god at this level is interacting with this entire army at this level and their mechanics are are, are working at the same level so that's uh, a really really cool uh extrapolation of of that of that fractal rule and in, in such a way that uh includes something interesting for this setting totally yeah absolutely um yeah i i know that uh that evil hat has has kind of this feeling about about fate uh fantasy that they're that they keep kind of a distance away from it a high fantasy that they have this attitude towards um that it's the, they're competing with the 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 biggest um names in the game and so they haven't even tried um i'm curious what your thought process was that that you were like no i'm i'm doing this chronicles is is going to be a thing right um i'm curious about that uh, well i mean i i'm i'm a principally a writer and and and, and a gamer um and really i'm sort of a business 
Um, so I think when um, I approach both Mindjammer and, and, and the Chronicles of Future Earth, my principal thought wasn't, oh my God, what about the competition? Um, it's, it's, is this going to be a good game? Is this going to be an awesome game? Am I going to really enjoy playing this? Um, and I think that's that's really how I've approached it. Uh, Chronicles of Future Earth was originally a BRP. Uh, it actually was originally a D20 thing. The first campaign we ever ran mm. um, was in 1999. Uh, using D20 and um, D&D third edition um, it moved over to um, to BRP in the in the, in the, um, in the noughties um, since then um, my thinking very much has been how to implement fate port in fantasy um, in, in the fantasy genre um, and that's really where Legends of Anglaire started and where the Chronicles of Future Earth um, took up the slack um, so really, I haven't I haven't mm. sat down and thought, oh my god, I'm going up against the big boys. Because to be honest, I don't think I don't think we are at all. You know, there's there's such a difference again in scale. It's it's something that for people who who love fate, um, and they want to play in a fate um, fantasy game, it provides, uh, and it, it does, and that's one thing I should stress. Um, even though there's a setting inside the Chronicles of Future Earth, um, it's a modular rule set. So hmm. you can take the print um, that are in the core book and you can roll your own setting completely, or you can apply the rules to your favorite fantasy setting, whichever it happens to be. Um, you can do the middle ground. Um, the the Springtide Civilizations in Future Earth is a very expansive setting. As you, as you start to look into it, there are elements of the multiverse in there. There are elements of, of, of travel by machines under the cities into, um, into different worlds, which were, were colonized in the far different, far distant uh, prehistoric past, which are some of the planing machines are still found the ruins of, um, of ancient cities. You can travel to other worlds, other dimensions. Um, so there is plenty of space within the existing setting to, to create your own space, to create your own campaign. Um, so, you know, on these three different levels, use the setting as is, create your own space within the setting, create your own setting, or use the rules for um, existing setting you can do all of these things um with, with um, the chronicles of future earth and that was really my intention rather than trying to replace um anybody else's favorite frp g uh, was to was to provide a an implementation of fate four um, in the fantasy sphere which covered all the basics really. yeah and and i think it was a great uh, i think it was a great decision really um because there's been kind of a void <laughs> in my opinion um and and that was why i was so excited when i saw this this kickstarter launching that that i was like i've been waiting i've been waiting for this high fantasy uh that, that it seems like um <laughs> everybody's kind of, kind of kept their distance from you know um so yeah and i think i think also you know there, it is a crowded space but there are there are also some um some mechanical issues which which mm -hmm. i've been addressing um and i think I think that comes more with the gameplay that you expect from um, from a fantasy game. Um, I mean, fate um, fate isn't. There's always a big debate about whether fate's a story game or not. And there are story game elements, but there's also a very very traditional base to to the fate system. Um, you know, it's, it's it's a skills. You roll your dice. You add a number. You compare to a difficulty based. Um, you know, it's all fairly traditional. Um, it's when the aspects come in that's the the, the, the mm -hmm. funky narrative stuff starts to happen. And for me, that's the cool thing. For me, I, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a gamer in a way. I do enjoy story games, but I, I really like the the, the tactical, um, not overly complex. I'm not rules heavy, but I like a, I like a medium to, um, and I think Fate provides that. But it also has this glorious ability to have this aspects layer, which you can pretty, pretty much die. It very very immersively or you can play it in a very abstract meta way it's really up to you and it's that dialability that i think is uh, is glorious um, from fate but at the same same time when you know i think i think the appreciation of the fate core rules has been something that's picked up um, that's quite lightweight and um, that, that does stress the slightly more free we to role-playing games that a lot of people who play fantasy games maybe don't want um, quite as much so when I've been writing the Chronicles of Future Earth, I've been really coming up against expectations. One of those expectations, 
but also a slightly more tactical approach to to play. And that doesn't mean miniatures on the table, but maybe you found yourself when when you're when you're playing um, against uh, in the Swallower of Souls, for example, if you're on the Black Galley coming up against the Beast of Morbius <laughs> or against the um, the Galley Man and so on, you know that, that you have to take a tactical approach to how you deal with this. You, you can't just mm -hmm. wade in there and roll your dice and, and invoke lots of stuff. The bonus cap prevents you from doing the let's all pile, mm -hmm. pile our fair and kill the bad in one go um, approach. There's a slightly more, there are more tech, uh, more, more tactical expectations from the way the rules mechanics interact. The fake core. Um, and that's something I've been really quite, um, quite careful to implement because what I want to do with um, the Chronicles of Future Earth is to be able to have a, an actually really gritty, dangerous feel to the game where, where wounds are significant, um, where you end up um, facing real doom and real danger that you can't simply narrate away with, with some judicious expenditure of fate points. It's, it's a game where, where the threat is very real. Um, and for me, that's something is my own sweet spot with fancy role playing, which I wanted to implement in, uh, in Chronicles. Yeah, absolutely. And and giving characters many more options uh, as far as instead of sticking to that uh, that formula of, you know, you get two or three stunts and then anything beyond that is tapping into your uh, tapping into your fate points, your refresh um, and looking at a Chronicles character sheet. It, it, it's like, you know, all, all these all these options. Right. Um, and still have still have a five refresh. So it, it's exciting to have that kind of versatility uh, right right from the go. And I think it's, it's also part of the, the planning for, for long term play. Um, mm. I, th I think if you're if you're playing Fate as a, as a short term game, as a one shot, just a few sessions, um, then it's OK um, to to use the tried and tested way of solving problems. Um, but what you don't want in a long term um, campaign is basically always using the same mechanical solution to problems. Um, and I think um, Fake Core, as is written, um, a lot of buy-in from players, which is great. Um, and as a short term game, um, that works awesomely well. But in the long term, you really want to, to have the ability to change the gameplay um, and to, to alternate the way you approach problem solving. Um, and to have different mechanical, different levels of mechanical support. So a lot of what I've done in, in the Chronicles Fate, it's not really a variant, but an implementation, let's say, has been to to tweak and and diffuse and to make less attractive um, the, the obvious ways of solving problems that Fake or normally has. And the bonus cap is a key example of that, for example. Yeah, yeah. Players stacking up all of their all of their aspects and cashing them out on a, on a single most important move. Um, instead, yeah, they're 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 kind of uh, taking more tactical approach. Absolutely, and utilizing a wider variety of of abilities. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think that's totally working. Um, yeah, I'm I'm curious about the uh, uh, obviously um, you're an incredible world builder. Uh, the the depth of the chronicles setting is is vast, um, and and I know that you could talk forever about it, <laughs> of course. But um, I'm really curious. About... <laughs> Steady on, <off>, yeah. <laughs> yes, um, but I'm really curious about uh, the the hint of um, you, and you even mentioned it earlier of of the worlds beyond the planing machine you've mentioned, and the uh, and the other dimensions. And I'm really curious how those uh, tie in into the Chronicles world and what uh, what kind of uh, sweeping consequences this has being having this world tangled with uh, other dimensions. Yeah, I mean, you've, you've really touched upon um, the, the, the increase in scale, the increase in scope um, that the game should have as you advance in long term play. And indeed, you can do it in, in, in short term games as well. Um, but it's yeah, the, the, the setting is very expansive. Um, and I think I want I think really did have that sort of that more cocky and 60s, 70s, 80s multiversal feel to it as well. Yeah. Um, I'm a huge fan of a game that's not very well known these days called the Arduin Grimoire. Do you remember the Arduin? Or do you know of the Arduin Grimoire? Mm -hmm. um, it's a, it was it was probably the original fantasy heartbreaker. 
and it was it, it started being written about 1977 by a guy called Dave Hargrave um, and it was this awesomely gonzo set of rules additions to the original Little Brown books and D&D &D. Um, and it came out in three equally slim I've got them somewhere here on my shelves um, these three equally slim Little Brown books um, and it was really um, all about people with machine guns and demon swords um, taking on multiple different dimensions and advanced to, to a hundredth level um, and all, it, it was glorious it was it was just um, I loved it. it partly it was in, as it was written it was completely unplayable uh, but nevertheless we played the hell out of it and I know a lot of people did um, and I think that ethos is it's part of that 80s that 70s 80s cosmic fantasy um, uh, uh, philosophy that I wanted to bring into into the Chronicles as well. So really the, the playing machines and the idea that there was um, there was this huge interstellar civilization in the far distant past, we're talking 70 or 80,000 years ago, uh, that for some mysterious reason crashed and ended up in the Chronicles we have today. Um, hopefully that sets up a, um, a question in everyone's minds, you know, what happened? We want to know what's out there. Um, and I think a sense of wonder is really important when you create a setting. You know, it, it, it mustn't have all of the questions answered. Um, and for me as well, it's it's a it, it's a exploration. I have I have an idea of what the past of the Chronicles of Future Earth was like. I've got a good idea of what the present um, is like. And stones on the way which connect the two. Um, but basically, I want to explore this as well, um, and I think you know we can explore this together in, in the game and uh, in the adventures. And um, but yeah, there's a there's a there's a lot out there, and uh, I think it also gives you a kind of genre freedom as well. Um, you can play chronicles as it's written. It's very much terrestrial. It's very much earth based. It's down to earth. It's cities and um, uh, monsters and exploration and wilderness and urban and sometimes political, sometimes sorcerous, that kind of stuff. Um, but there is the option there to go big, to go dimensional, to go um, exploring and world hopping. But before that, I hope there's also a lot of curiosity about the rest of future Earth. Um, oh, yeah. What oh. the Ice Age? <laughs> What's under the ice? What are the other continents like at this time? Um, so there's a lot of exploration that can be done. Yeah, excellent. Um, yeah, so the Kickstarter is. Does that answer your question? It does. Yeah, yeah. I was I was mostly curious what what uh, like connection that that uh, the existence of the other of the other dimensions and the fact that they're connected. What kind of like bleed bleed over that has to this world? What what um, what interesting resources or or creatures or whatnot? Like how that colors this world? The fact that those doors are open. Uh, yeah, well, it, it definitely does. I mean, there are there are some of the generi and the species. The generi are the cousins of man. They're kind of the if we, if we genetically engineered ourselves to to um, fit to suit different environments, to different planetary environments, um, and seventy thousand years of those genetically modified humanoids living on Earth in a world where sorcery is real, what would those subspecies become? And they're the cousins of man. They're the generi. Um, the Estery are a similar kind of thing, but they're, you're looking at extraterrestrial um, beings, really, which came to Earth, probably tailored themselves to suit Earth's environment, and then again had this 70 or 80,000 years of this post-technological world where sorcery was real or increasingly real. What did they become? Um, so those, those parts of future Earth are profoundly anchored in this um, off-world idea of this uh, uh, this lost civilization, this lost interstellar civilization, um, and there are other things as well. The the future Earth is is without it's it's, it's exhausted in its resources. There's very little iron, um, very little metal left in the Earth. So a lot of that that stuff is brought through um, the planing machines from worlds where these resources still exist. Um, and the worlds are not it's not like highway. There are not thousands of worlds. There are very few of these planing machines. Mm. They're jealously guarded. That the stuff that wars are fought over, 
Um, so there are a handful of wells that are known of. Um, and, you know, if anybody finds a new planing machine, then it's a major just scrambled control of it and to find out what's on the other side, because there could be terrible dangers out there. And there sometimes are. Um, there are there are inroads of, of, of all kinds of creatures from the, the Armageddon of the gods, which are waiting out there, just trying to get back in and have a go at the world. Um, so that also informs a lot of the cosmology. Um, the place in the north of frozen tundra, where there are chaos beasts trying to invade the autocracy. Um, and they appear to also have some kind of relationship any machines it's there from outside in some way um, so yeah that i think the the civilization that's uh, that, that pre-existed uh, history in the chronicles um, still has a, an enormous impact on them on, on life today and it's something that you can interact with very very di directly if you want to excellent yeah <laughs> Very cool. The kick, the am kick, I getting closer? Am I getting, oh yeah, no. getting closer to answering your question? No, that, that was it. That was it. Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Cool. It's it's always like, uh, yeah. Did 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 we connect? You know, on, on that. Um, but yeah, that that totally does it. <laughs> or did I just go off and talk about my favorite subject again? <laughs> no, no. Um, I, I was with you. Um, the Kickstarter is is coming along uh, well, right? Already fully funded. Um, and we're getting to uh, getting to some is, stretch yeah. goals, yeah. Um, I'm posting a link in, the, in the chat. Good, uh, yeah. I think we've unlocked about four, four or five stretch goals so far, um, which has made a, a really compelling chronicler pack, which was the uh, the one thing that I, I want. So I've taken a slightly different approach with this Kickstarter because um, I wanted to have a really nice basic kit of stuff available for everyone. So it's a nice big core with a GM screen, Chronicles dice, Chronicles fate tokens, a nice big map. Um, and then on top of that, we've unlocked um, a 32-page adventure called the Tower of Virigu and the Swallow of Souls, um, and a 16-page player folio, um, which contains everything that players need uh, at the table, kind of, kind of potted summary of rules and setting. And, okay. um, and all of this stuff is available in this great cup Chronicles pack. Um, which I think currently for the physical version of it is going for about $105. That's the pledge level for that. Lower pledges as well. You can just go for the core book or just the PDFs or just the PDF of the core book. Um, but the, the Chronicle Pack for me is the sweet spot in value. You're getting a lot of bang for your buck at um, $105, a load of material. Um, but we're also, I'm hoping that in the next uh, few days we unlock some of the, um, the stretch goals which are not related to the Chronicle Pack. There's a lot of supplements that are, that are lined up. Um, the next big one is something called Worm Hollow Veil. Vale, yeah, Worm Hollow Veil vale is the one I'm is... hoping for. <laughs> I mean, it's mostly written. Um, I'm, you know, I've got, I've got my big pile of papers here. It's, uh, it's all there. I've been working on it for a long time. Uh, but I'm just so looking forward to having this illustrated. Meaty stuff in there. Uh, excellent. Um, I have one uh, last big question. Uh, what kind of advice Ooh. would you give to uh, to fledgling role playing game uh, designers out there? <laughs> um, keep at it. <laughs> Just keep writing. Um, yeah. I think also be be brave um, when you're when you're writing. I think it's really really important to um to to follow your instincts um to read as much as possible and not mm. not necessarily to read within um the, the 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 framework of what you're trying to write mm. read widely um a lot of my ideas come from reading history from popular science from um, from mad stuff astrophysics humanism geomorphology meteorology anything that 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 gets me sparky and you think oh that make a really good idea in a game note it down hmm. so yeah read read as widely as you possibly can and also don't be don't be afraid to go a bit mad you know um i think the commercial side of things you know like this be that can come a little bit later um, i think it's important to have the courage of your own convictions to write something that you want to play 
you know that really for you is the is the setting or the game that that that, um, that hits the mark. And also be prepared to keep rewriting as well. I, I think one of the um, I, I do I do a, a fair bit of fiction writing alongside the RPG writing and. One of the things I've learned over over the years is that the first draft, when you first complete your manuscript, that's when the work starts, not <laughs> when it ends. Um, and that's the same. You know, that's that's when, with a role playing game, just as with a fiction work, it's just the same. Um, you you sit there and you think, okay, now I've got my, I've got my one hundred thousand, my two hundred thousand word manuscript. Um, I need to kill one one word in four because I've written too much. Everyone always writes too much. Uh, so scrub out all the words you don't. No need. Don't use two adjectives. I'm kind of a bit silly there. Um, but uh, really, really start polishing and really start refining. Um, and at that point, you can go out and uh, a lot and take notice of what people um, say because I think in aggregate, um, people are always more intelligent. I think that's one of the, one of the lovely things about writing for role playing games is that the people who play your games are professors, they're scientists, mm-hmm. they're industrialists, they're teachers, you know, and they're, they're on on balance they're infinitely more intelligent than I am, and I'm sort of really grateful to to have this feedback from people saying, well, you know, actually red dwarf flares don't quite work like that; they happen at a different part of the evolution. You know, and I'm like, Ooh, okay. I better write that down. Um, yeah. And that kind of stuff is, is really, really important. Games, same with rules and mechanics. People will see the holes in your mechanics far better than you will. Um, so, so take all that on board. Um, but yeah, the main thing I think is to... Is, um, I, I lived in, in Japan for many years, and one of my friends there was a, was a novelist who, who told me something that uh, really stuck in my mind. He said, um, a successful writer is um, is five percent talent and ninety five percent bloody mindedness, mm. um, and uh, I've always I've always kept that in mind. You know, you just have to keep at it, and uh, we'll work. Keep at it. <laughs> just keep at it at the grindstone. <laughs> at uh, it. Yeah. Yeah. JFDI. <laughs> Excellent. Um, was there was there anything that we haven't talked about that 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 is uh, that's burning that that you just that you really want to get off your chest that you want to talk about? Yeah, I mean, obviously the Kickstarter, you know, we've talked about that, we've touched upon it, but please, mm-hmm. if you're watching this, come over and have a look and download the, the quick start. Um, you know, consider consider um, pledging. We have, I think at this date, we're on Thursday, so we have Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and we finish at midnight GMT on Sunday. There's some really good stuff in there. Um, and we still have a lot of things we can unlock um, and, uh, you know, add value to, to the basic offer and uh, in- increase the number of add-ons we have available. And, uh, yeah, come and, come and, uh, come and check it out. Um, it's uh, it's going to be a big, expansive setting. This is something that, that I and Mindjammer Press are in for the long term. It's like Mindjammer. Um, you know, we want to support this with a big, long line of supplements and really explore together. Uh, what I hope is going to be a, a fascinating new role playing ex- experience. Yeah, I'm I'm stoked to see it. The the posts that you've made on the Kickstarter so far of uh, of the two the two big updates that were like here's the list of uh, of all of the supplements in this in this avenue, and here are the list of the of all the supplements we have planned in this avenue. And I was like, whoa, yeah, this is this is big. This is this going to be a big thing. Um, so yeah, definitely. Uh, I've just got. I brought. I actually brought my. Um, this. These are my notes. Whoa. <laughs> um, so this is the. <laughs> so, distilling a lot of this into um, into the core book. But basically, what you have here is uh, this isn't everything, but this is the stuff that I've sort of distilled into book form so that I can reference it. But, ah. uh, from that, we're gonna we're gonna hopefully get some uh, get some cool supplements out there. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, well, I've posted the. Uh, if you're watching it live, I've got the link uh, to the Kickstarter in the chat. If you're watching this on on YouTube at a later point, that'll be in the in the description. But uh, make sure to check it out. If in, and uh, viewers, if you're interested in seeing uh, this be played, uh, Material Components has been running uh, uh, the Quick Start module, Swallow Over Souls, and also Sarah has has posted a, a video as well on YouTube of of her and her crew running it. Um, to to see it in play, so 
<laughs> any any last any last thoughts, Sarah? Uh, well, just thank you to you and your team, Keith, for, for doing the actual plays. And it's been fantastic to see such a, a, a slick setup and really delving into you know what the settings is capable of, what the rules are capable of. Um, I've really enjoyed watching, and uh, I know there's still at least two more episodes to come, and uh, I mm -hmm. hope you're having a blast. But thank you for your advocacy. And uh, thank you to everyone out there, uh, um, first of all, for watching, um, but secondly, for backing the campaign as well, because uh, there's one thing that's uh, is a peculiar thing that happens when you're um, when you're running the Kickstarter campaign. You, you feel, feel very close to people who are backing, because you actually see how much their contribution matters um, to, to the project. Um, and as a, you know, I have a great sense of gratitude to everyone who's helping us uh, make this a reality. So thank you again to you. Thank you for watching. And then thanks for backing the Kickstarter. Excellent. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, and we will, uh, we'll catch you all on the Kickstarter. <laughs>